I'd like to tell you what the best day of my life was. The greatest day of my life. But before I get there, I have to tell you what happened before, a little bit at least. When I came to this country, I had been up till 19 years of age, I had been a nominal Catholic, and I knew very little of the Bible. I was very sad with world uh, conditions. I was by myself. I had lost all my friends because uh, I had left my country. My parents weren't here. And I was just uh, a very easy prey of the pseudo gospel of Jehovah's Witnesses. I remember one thing in particular, one evening after a Bible study. I had uh, learned about the 144,000, and I was reading the Bible in the book of John, and I read the 14th chapter. I felt very happy, and an instant afterwards I felt very sad. And you'll understand why. John chapter 14. Jesus our Lord said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Exercise faith in God. Exercise faith also in me. In the house of my Father there are many abodes. Otherwise, I would have told you, because I am going my way to prepare a place for you. Also, if I go my way and prepare a place for you, I am coming again and will receive you home to myself, that where I am, you also may be, and where I am going, you know the way. And I felt so happy. I felt touched by the love of Jesus, and I felt so sad because I realized it wasn't for me. It was only for the 144,000. And I remember I called my mother, who was also studying with the witnesses, and I showed her this. And we both felt very sad, and we tried to encourage each other with the idea of paradise but somehow it wasn't it wasn't as pleasant as being with Jesus but anyway time went by I became a pioneer very soon after that I went to Bethel well as you all know or most of you anyways the organization doesn't highly recommend one going to college but if you do have a college education, then they'll use it. And that's what happened to me. Within a few months of being in Bethel, I was asked to come to the uh, offices of the uh, factory overseer, and he told me that I was going to start working in translation, and they were going to train me. I started as a proofreader, and in, like in about six months, I started to translate. First, it was... Uh, watching the world, you probably know what that is, you report witnesses. Then it was awake articles, then it was articles in the watchtower, books, and I even had the opportunity of working in the revision of the translation into Spanish of the uh, large print Bible, this one I, I'm holding here. And uh, I'm mentioning this because it has to do with the way the Lord used to help us to come to him. And I want to mention some words of First Peter that are very dear to me. They say, out of darkness into his wonderful light. Brothers, once the Lord has called us into his wonderful light, we appreciate in what deep darkness we were. And at that time, we didn't know. So how did he do it? How did he work in our lives? 
One day, we were revising this Bible, as I said, and that was the first step. There is a, a lie, by the way, in the foreword of the Spanish New World Translation. It says that, that the Greek text was consulted. No, that's not true. And it, really, if you just think about it, why would anyone able, capable to consult the Greek text would want to translate the Bible from an English translation? You would just go right to the original translation and translate from the Greek. Neither of the translators in the Spanish department knew the first thing about Greek. But anyway, in Revelation 11.1, 1, the English uses uh, an expression which is temple sanctuary. That can be uh, rendered in Spanish in at least two ways. You could just put the word temple and next to it the word sanctuary in Spanish and make sanctuary an adjective. And so you're talking about a temple that in effect is a sanctuary. Or you could say this is the sanctuary of a temple. So we had a problem. How do we do it? So we sent uh, a note to Freddy France. And the answer was that it had to be rendered sanctuary of the temple because the Greek word naos or naos, I don't know how to pronounce it, meant the sanctuary of the temple. Well, that just was a fact, but it stuck in my mind. Somehow it was there in my brain. And then one day, a dear brother for which I think all of you are still praying, and I hope you keep praying, show me scripture. It's in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 15. And he showed it to me in the interlinear translation of the Bible. If you had the interlinear with you, the New World Translation, interlinear, you would see that it says, Through this they are inside of the throne of the God, and they are rendering sacred service to him of day and of night in the divine habitation of him. And if you were to check the Greek, that divine habitation of him was his nows. Right, Brother Wesley? Okay, because I don't know any Greek, but that's what it says here. Now, the thought immediately came, well, why so much fuss about translating temple sanctuary as sanctuary of the temple in Revelation 11.1 1, and in, in the other four uh, portions in which the New World uses that phrases, and yet nothing about that fact here. And it was quite a shock. But I told, I told this friend, I said, I said Rene, but uh, we know that there are two classes and it's only the 144,000 that are in union with Christ. And you know what he said? He asked me a question. He said, Chris, do you feel condemned now, you can ask that question to any one of Jehovah's Witnesses because it's really a question that will help them. The answer will probably be, be no, and it will be an honest answer because these are people that love the Lord. These are people that think they're serving Jehovah. So then he showed me Romans 8.1. It said, Therefore, those in union with Christ Jesus have no condemnation. If you can ever show that scripture to one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you may be able to help them. Because it's very difficult to think that you are condemned. And yet that scripture says, 
If you're in union with Christ Jesus, you have no condemnation, which to anyone that thinks a little means if you're not in union with Christ Jesus, you have condemnation. So I can, in all honesty, say that that was all that that brother said to me. From then on, I started to read, and I gave them the benefit of the doubt. The first thing I read was the book, Life Everlasting in the Freedom of the Sons of God. I read that book very carefully again. All those chapters are about how you could tell you were a son of God. And I just happened to have two days off, so I just read constantly during those two days what I read helped me to see that there were no basis for what they were teaching. And all of a sudden, scriptures started to really pour in, come in, and I could see so many scriptures in the Bible that showed that to be a son of God, all you had to do was to have faith in Christ. So that was so beautiful to me, so wonderful, that I wanted to share it with other friends. I had in my mind no animosity whatsoever. I can say that I don't have any animosity against them as persons, as people. I had in my mind no feeling whatsoever of forming any sect or any, uh, any re rebellion whatsoever. But here were the most wonderful good news I had ever heard in my life. That meant that, after all, I could be with Jesus. Those words of John 14 came back to my mind. And no paradise on earth will ever have the value of being with Jesus. It could never beat that feeling. Well, we learn a few other things. We learn my wife and I, and she'll talk to you too. And I say we learn, and I want to tell you one thing. My wife has been a real gift from the Lord from the very beginning. Most of the times when I learn something and I show it to her, in the beginning she couldn't see it, but she would always take time to look it up by herself. And she has stuck with me and... Well, she'll tell you about herself, okay? I'm going to let her tell you. But I just want to express here in front of everyone that the Lord really gave me a wonderful blessing when he gave me my wife. And I can say that. Thank you, Lord. Okay, all this time, my mother on her own she used to go out from house to house like every witness or just about like every other witness does and one day she found a Pentecostal and this Pentecostal showed her something in Romans chapter 8 that made her eyes wide open she was with a pioneer and the pioneer tried to contradict everything the uh, Pentecostal was saying. And yet my mother said she couldn't put it out of her mind. She went back home. And now, mind you, my mother can hardly read. She read Romans 8, and she read Romans 8, and she read Romans 8, and she read Romans 8, till finally she says, I got it. Well, after that, she kept praying for all of us. And she, little by little, started to miss meetings. She stopped going in field service. She didn't know exactly what to do. She didn't know who Jesus was either. But it was a beginning. And I would get home, and she would ask me a question. And I would try to put her down, try to knock her a question. Finally, one day I said, do you think that you know more than the brothers of the anointed that are in Bethel governing the organization? And my mother never answered. 
You know, she went about it very meekly, very quiet. But anyway, when my eyes were open, I said, well, this is what my mother has been trying to tell me all along. And I remember I said to my, my wife, honey, I have to tell my mother. And my wife says, you better be careful. And I says, I don't have to be careful. I know she knows. <laughs> and uh, we went home, and I remember we read John chapter 17. And we started to try to understand what we were reading and, ex and explain it as we went along. And when I finally told her what I believed, my mother had tears in her eyes. She said, well, finally my prayers had been answered. He said, I used to pray that you would see this too. Uh, it was so beautiful. We embraced ourselves. Our brothers, our fear of death was gone. It was the most blessed thing what we learn on that idea and this is all we knew we could become sons of God by having faith in Christ well we believe what we had what we were render, uh, learning so I started to tell this to some of my best friends show them from the Bible and one of them without telling me anything went to the society to the service department and accused me of being an apostate so I got a phone call, and in the phone call they told me that they wanted to meet with me. But the Lord is so kind, because a few days before, something happened that spiritually separated me completely from the Watchtower Society. What was it? I became a real... A real Bible student. I started to read every book of the Bible in all translations I could. And I made a cassette, my own cassette, of the Good News Bible translation of John in Spanish. And when I did the tape itself, I don't remember, I, don't, I didn't see this point. But when I was listening to the cassette, I heard something that stopped my world, literally. I had to stop the cassette, put it back, listen to it again, put it back again, listen to it again. I got out every single Bible I had. I, it was like if I could hit myself, because what I had read there meant that every single thing I had done was absolutely zero, was absolutely in vain. What was it? It's John chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And I was reading from the Good News Bible in Spanish, so I'll read it to you from the Good News Bible in English. And Jesus said there, Nor does the Father himself judge anyone. He has given his Son the full right to judge so that all will honor the Son in the same way as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And really that means whoever does not honor the Son in the same way does not honor the Father. Well, that meant that all the years in Bethel, all the years of Pioneer, it was nothing because I had not been honoring the Son in the same way. He was someone somewhere else in the background. Well, I remember I called my wife and I said, listen to this. And I just played it back again and she heard it. And to her it didn't mean anything. She insisted that we had been giving the Son the same honor. But anyway, we left it like that. Now she, she knows that that's not the way it is now. But, but it, that in itself literally severed my spiritual relations with the Watchtower Society. That weekend, just before the Monday when I was called on the phone, something else happened that made me realize to what extent I was in a bad position. 
It was in a circuit assembly, it was in the elders meeting. And using Hebrews chapter 12, the district overseer told us that we had to discipline the brothers. Anyone that reads Hebrews chapter 12 and is told that he has to discipline the brothers, if he understands what he's reading, he also knows that that makes him an enemy of God. Because what that says is that God is going to use his enemies. When his enemies persecute his people, he's going to use that persecution for the good of his people. And that's why it's called discipline. And he tells his people, don't reject that discipline. Accept it. It's going to make, make it better for you. So I went back home and I was so sick. I remember I had to sit on, in a chair. I couldn't cry. I could just about sigh. It was like if there was nothing. The whole thing was a hoax. The whole thing really was bad. And I didn't even know the half of it yet. But anyway, that Monday I got a phone call. I was supposed to go to a meeting. And this meeting was with, was with five men. One of them was a member of the governing body, and the others were members of the different uh, committees the society has. The member of the governing body, well, I think I better not mention these names, but uh, these men treated me in such a way that I felt that if they would have had the power of uh, torturing me, and this I can say in the presence of my God, I'm not lying. If they would have had the power of torturing me, if they would have had the power of sending me to the stake, I wouldn't be here today. I felt so afraid that at one point I told my wife, I said, honey, if by any chance they find me dead, don't believe that I committed suicide. Don't believe it, because I haven't done anything bad. I've just talked about my faith. So I'm not going to commit suicide. So I felt that my life was in danger. When my wife heard that, she said, I'm going to you, with you to every single one of those meetings. <laughs> and if I went outside in Bethel to, to, to the uh, hall to throw out the garbage, and just uh, uh, took a, a minute longer, my wife would just run out <laughs> because she could see that I was really scared. And she, she thought probably, well, if he is so scared, there may be a reason for it, and she didn't want to take any risk. But anyway, the place where they would take me was a very lonely place. Here I was, sometimes there were up to seven men bombarding questions. Ah. Uh, they were treating me in such a way. A member of the governing body said I was a worm. Another brother called me a cancer. Another one called me a leech. And these words were not uh, said in a very nice way. They were said in a very angry mood. The hatred was coming out of their eyes. They were not able to refute the things I was saying. I remember at one point I said to the brother of the governing body, I said, can you uh, explain me this scripture, 1 John 5, 1, which says, everyone believing that Jesus is the Christ has been born from God. And all he could say was, I am not here to answer your questions. Later on in the meeting with my wife only, these men told my wife, however, that they almost fell out of the seat when they saw that scripture. These are men in the high places of that organization. So if you can ever find a way of showing in a loving way this scripture to a witness, you may be able to help him. Because if, if that witness agrees with you in, that, in the fact that he believes that Jesus is the Christ, 
then he would have to believe that he has been born from God. You see. But remember, only the 144,000 believe that. So that's a good one, an easy way of doing it, if at all possible. Anyway, as it, as it went, there was another brother in the Spanish department. He had come from Spain. They had called him from Spain, where he had, uh, where he had been a missionary for, oh, about 13 or 14 years. And he came and he helped us in translation, and he also was learning some of these things at the same time, although in a different way. And he was also called in. They found somebody uh, talked about him. And as, a, as an end result, he was his fellowship. My wife was his fellowship for the sole fact of being my wife. That was it, for being my wife. And I was his fellowship. A little later on, although my mother and father resigned, my mother was his fellowship. And the only thing we can make up was because she was my mother. That's about it. But anyway, we were all this fellowship. And so, there we were. We were all by ourselves, we thought. <laughs> but do you, do you remember what happens in John chapter 9? In John chapter 9, there is something that, that to me was the Bible came alive. And I'll tell you why. There was a blind man there. And Jesus and the apostles went by and they asked him, who, did, who sinned? Was it the man? Was it his parents? And Jesus told him, well, that the blindness of this man was so that the glory of God could be seen. And he did a wonderful miracle. He spit on this man's eyes. He told him, go and wash yourself. And, he, and the man did. Probably somebody had to help him. Jesus left. The man never saw Jesus. When he went and he washed himself, he was able to see. I feel that that's what happened to us. Why? Because many times from door to door, people try to help us. It is true that many times they throw the doors at us. But many times they do try to help us. And I remember times when people really try to show me the gospel. And they would say, I will pray for you. And I just laughed. What well, these people are going to pray for me, you know. Anyway, uh, by choice we had blinded ourselves, because like Jesus said, "I am the light of the world." And unless you're not with Him, well, if you have no light, you're as good as blind, are you? So uh, He was the one, as far as I'm concerned, that opened my eyes. And I started to see. And I knew it was by having faith in him. I didn't know who he was at that time, but I knew by, by having faith in him, I could be a son of God. And that changed my life. Anyway, uh, what happened to this man? When we st he started seeing, instead of getting very happy about the whole thing, the Jews took him to the Pharisees. And that's exactly what happened to us. When I started seeing... When I got so happy, hey, I'm seeing things in the Bible, I was taken to a committee meeting. And I was taken to the highest hierarchy of the Watchtower Society for that committee meeting. Well, in that meeting, it would have been easy for me to say, well, no, I believe that if I stay in the organization, I will gain life. I believe it's just by staying in this organization, but I kept saying no. It is by having faith in Jesus. And I thought, if I didn't do that, I was denying my Lord. And I remember what he said. If anyone confesses me publicly, I shall confess him in the presence of my Father and of the angels. And if anyone denies me, I will deny him. So my, my conscience wouldn't allow me to go back. And that's why, really, we were disfellowship, because otherwise it would have been a matter of just perhaps a reproof or whatever, but we would have not been in this fellowship. As it was, though, the Lord had opened our eyes, and at least, just like that man did, I couldn't say that what had happened was bad. 
I had to say this has come from God. Just like that man knew that the man who opened my eyes must come from God, he said. Because whoever heard of a sinner opening the eyes of anyone? You know. And it's one, one thing is very interesting too. If you go over that chapter carefully, you'll find that that man's eyes were really spiritually open in that trial. You check. He first calls Jesus a man. Then he calls him a prophet. And then he winds up saying he must come from God. And at the end of the uh, trial, when he meets Jesus, what does he do? He worships Jesus. What had happened? He could see what the Pharisees were all about. And that's what happened in that trial to me too. I could see the hatred. I could, I could see the evil that was there that caused my wife to be disfellowship without any reason whatsoever. Anything that had to do with me had to be cut off because I was a real danger. Well, a cancer, you want to operate a cancer and extirpate, extirpate it. So, as I said, this chapter is very dear to me. But why? Well, you remember what happened to the man when he confessed Jesus? He was his fellowship. And then what happened? The next verse is very important. Let's read it together. Okay? It's on John chapter 9. I think it's on the beginning on verse 35. It says, when Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man. And you know, brothers and sisters, that's exactly what happened. Jesus used a very dear brother who's here sitting back there. One night, I got a call from him. His name is Dwayne. I love Dwayne dearly. I... I was kind of hoping I could uh, hug Duane. And I was embarrassed. I said, will, will I do it? I, I really wanted to do it. So when I saw him and I was telling him who I was, Duane embraced me, you know. And so, praise the Lord, the, the love that we uh, had on those calls and this is very special to me. This is why I'm getting a little emotional, maybe a lot. <laughs> but why? What was it? Well, I was hoping Duane would tell me what was exactly the words that when that we talked the very night, we talked several times, many times. But there was one night in, w in which he finally helped me to see who Jesus was. And I was expecting Duane to tell me because I had forgotten but Duane had forgotten also. So last night I went in prayer to the Lord and I said, Lord, please help me to remember what was it that he told me. And sure enough, the Lord helped me to remember, you know. And I remember now, maybe Duane will remember, but it had to do with Abraham and Isaac. It had to do with Abraham and Isaac, Isaac being the only begotten son of, uh, of uh, or the first begotten son of Abraham. And when God asked, Abraham to offer Isaac was he asking Isaac to offer anyone lesser uh, or excuse me was he offering uh, was he asking Abraham to offer anyone lesser inferior to he himself to Abraham himself was Isaac the inferior as a man to his father no he wasn't so was God going to offer any lesser than what he had asked Abraham? In that moment, I understood what being the Son of God was. This man had come from God. He was the manifestation of God in the flesh. At that time, I understood the love of God for the first time. I remember Duane also said, and see how much the Lord remi reminded me last night, Duane. Uh, I remember you said, it's easier, 
And I repeated that afterwards, but I never remember that you had said it, but now I remember you did. It, it's easier for a general to tell uh, one of his soldiers, you go and die for those people. Go out there and in the front of the battle and die for them. It's very easy to do that. But it isn't that easy to get dressed as a common soldier and come down and do it yourself. You know, and that's exactly what God did for us. Anyway, uh, may, I, may I please make a parenthesis here? At lunch today I was eating with a, a very dear sister and also a couple and my wife that I love very much. And uh, this dear sister asked a, a very interesting question that m made me think a lot. He's, he, she asked something along the lines of, how can we understand God? How do we visualize God? And I, I really didn't know what to say. Um, because she says, well, you see Jesus and, and you see God. Uh, and my wife and, and the married couple gave very good answers. But I wasn't able to, to give any answer. And then a little later, the, the married sister uh, said something that really helped me to, to understand the answer. She said she had seen this man who was all love. And he was so loving, so affectionate, so compassionate. You could see it in his love, in his eyes, in his expressions. And then I said, that's it. That, that's how I really see God. When I look at the eyes of Jesus, I see the compassion of God, the kindness of God, the mercy of God. When I see his clothing, I look at the righteousness of God. When I see his hands, I look at the love of my God because I see those nail marks there. Anyway, that night, uh, Duane told me what I had to do to be born again and to accept the Lord. And I remember I went home and I prayed and I, I prayed to Jesus for the first time in my life. And I, I told him every single sin that I could think of. And I could only see Jesus hanging in that cross. And, I, and I, I'm just thinking, you died for me. And I asked him to come into my life, to cleanse my heart, to save me, to do with me whatever he wanted to do. And I remember the tears were flowing out of my eyes like it was, it was something, it was the best day of my life. And, uh, the Lord came into my heart and I knew I had been born again. Not only that, I understood what being saved was. I, I understood for the first time what Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11 mean, which I had never understood before. I mean, unless you experience this, there's no one that can tell you it's not A plus B equals C. This is something you have to experience. But here it is. I understood it that day. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. See, I had just asked Jesus to come. And like he says in his word, live in me. Live in my heart. Here it says, in union with Christ, you were circumcised. Not with the circumcision that is made by men, but with the circumcision made by Christ, which consists of being freed from the power of this sinful self. That, then I understood why the angel says, call him Jesus, because he will free his people from his sins. And I understood why he could tell the Jews when he said, you shall learn the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And a little later on he said, the Son 
will set you free. And he had explained, you're in bondage to sin, you're a slave to sin, but I can liberate you. That doesn't make you sinless. It doesn't make you sinless, but that power that sin has goes. And the closer you get to the Lord, the weaker that power gets. And you know it. And you know it's not you, the one who's doing the work. You know it's the Lord, the one who's doing that work. And no one has to explain it to you. No one has to tell you it's there. Then you really start understanding the love of God and all the wonderful things that are related to salvation. So I was so happy, I went to our bedroom and I told my wife, I told my wife two new things. I told her Jesus was God, and I told her I, am, I was saved. <laughs> so you know what her answer was? She said, what's next? Idol worship? <laughs> Why don't I let her now tell you her part of the story, and if I have time, I'd like to tell you some few other things that the Lord has made for both of us, okay? Yes, when Chris first told me that I almost died, I said, what, what are we going to be doing next, worshiping idols? I just couldn't believe it. That, I think if there's anything hard for a witness to understand is the deity of Christ. And it wasn't as simple for me as it was for Chris. It was very difficult, and it took a while, took quite a while for me. When um, we were at Bethel and he first told me what he was learning, I, I guess I have this terrible attitude. I always say, well, don't tell me anymore. And every time he always brought this new point, don't tell me anymore, I'll find out on my own. And that was my attitude when he first told me about, he read to me Romans 8, 1. And I said, well, no, I'm not condemned. But I said, I don't want you to tell me anymore. It was, it was too shocking for me to find out that now I had a heavenly hope, that it was an earth which I loved so much. And I said, no, don't tell me anymore. I want to read and I want to pray. And it so happened Chris had a speaking assignment. Those who are Jehovah, Jehovah's Witnesses know that. Uh, from Bethel, they assigned the brothers to go and give talks to different congregations. And so Chris had to go that weekend. And I said, I'm not going. I'm, I want to stay. So I spent the two days reading and praying to Jehovah. That's the first time I had read the Bible with really reading it. And I couldn't deny it. I, just, I said, well, what he told me is true. But I couldn't, I couldn't deny it, and I, yet I wasn't convinced of it. I couldn't really believe it. And I kept telling Jehovah, I didn't know Jesus then, I kept saying, oh, Jehovah, I want to live here. I don't, I don't want to go to heaven. And, you know, it was so difficult for me to accept that. I was, I've been a Jehovah Witness all my life. I've never known anything else. That's where I've been brought up since I was five years old. So it was very difficult for me to accept it. But I, I, I wanted to read and find out for myself. And every time Chris told, tried to tell me something different, I said, okay, let me read. So I would go by myself and I would read. And I couldn't deny it. It was there. It was in, in, in my own Bible. Then I started, Chris had, he's always had a lot of different Bibles. So I started looking at all the other translations. And it was even more clear, of course, from the New World Translation. I said, oh my God, what is this? But when we were called to committee meetings, about a month or two before we even found out about anything, we had decided we wanted to leave that. So we had been pondering over the fact we wanted to have a family. But we liked Bethel, so we weren't too sure whether we should leave or not leave. And Chris said, well, if you want to leave, I'll leave. And I said, well, if you want to leave, I'll leave. So it was always like that, you know, about a year passed and we were still there. And that year we had decided we're leaving. So a month later, this brother talks to Chris. And he finds out all this new information, which he starts sharing with other people. Well, we got to the committee meetings before we knew it. I didn't even know what was happening. I wasn't convinced of anything. And when they first called me to the meeting, Chris says, if you want to, I'll go with you. I didn't even know he had been to a committee meeting that day. I was working. He came back. He said, I was just committee meeting. He had been gone for hours and I didn't know where he was. 
and they call me. And I said, they call me. And uh, Chris says, I'll go with you. So we had to go walk, I think, to another factory building. I didn't even know where the place was. So he walked with me. It was on the 10th floor, one of the factory buildings, way out in the deep corner behind these big cartons and everything. It was kind of spooky place. And you get in there to a little office. And these men, I have never been at before a committee meeting. I, I, don't, I, was, I was kind of trembling inside. And I'm usually the type of person that cries very easily, and yet I, I, I don't know. I, I know now what it was. I know God was helping me. But at that point, I, I just sat there and I looked at them, and they asked me questions about the organization. And all I could do was look at them. I didn't know what to say. I mean, what can I say? And they, they said to me, well, do you believe that the organization is the tool God is using to direct his people nowadays? And, and though I wanted to answer yes, I couldn't answer yes. Uh, and I said, well, uh, I don't know. And I said, what do you mean you don't know? And, and I said, well, uh, I'm not sure. I can't be 100% sure of that. And so they, they kept questioning me, and I, 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 well, I don't know. I, that's all I could say, I don't know, because I wasn't sure of one thing or the other at that point, and I, but I couldn't tell them, this is it, the organization. So they said, okay, they left, they didn't let us go. And I said, well, that's it. The next day they called us, and they said they decided to have a judicial committee that time. I guess they wanted to know where I stood in the whole matter. So the next time, it was going to be a real committee meeting, five men there. And so they started asking all these questions about the uh, heavenly hope and what you believe and is, uh, one, only one hope for everyone, the 140,000, the uh, anointed, about the blood issue. I didn't know anything about that. I said, well, I don't know. All I could know was, all I could tell them was, well, I, I can't deny what the Bible says. And, and at that time, even though I wasn't really convinced, I said, I do believe that there's a heavenly hope for everyone. And I can't deny that. I can't deny that now. And he says, well, you can wait on the organization. And uh, they'll bring out the information in due time. And I, all you have to be is truthful to the organization, be loyal to the organization. And I said, well, I... I've always thought that I've been teaching everyone to be loyal to Jehovah. That's what I always tell the people I study with. Be loyal. Not to me, don't ever look at me or at the men. Look at God. I said, my father always read the Bible, and that's what he always told us, to be loyal to Jehovah. And now you bring this thing to organization, organization. I said, I can't be loyal to, to an organization. I said, it has to be to God. Well, that dooms anybody, right, in front of a committee meeting. And... Um, well, it went on for about a week. We finally got this fellowship. I, I never believed that I could go to meetings like that and just be as calm as, as, a per, as any person can be and never cry, never stutter, answer whatever question they ever asked as best as I could answer. And then when they, Chris apologized for having talked to the brother he did talk because he never had the bad purpose of driving him away from the organization. We weren't thinking of that at that time. So then decided to change the, uh, the accusation from apostasy, apostasy to covering up. We are going to be the fellowship for covering up an apostasy because we were supposed to, supposedly we were supposed to be in conjunction with three other people at Bethel. And uh, we were part of this conspiration against the society and trying to get people away from the organization. And we didn't know that. We, didn't, we never talked to the other brothers about these points so we couldn't tell them anything about them they weren't even at Bethel at that time so we said well we can't answer those questions about them so that one day at the end of that week on a Friday they announced it to us at five o'clock everybody had gone out work had finished and they called us in they called the other couple first they fellowship the brothers they didn't fellowship his wife and then they called Chris and I and all those five men were sweating they were so nervous and everything, and he would look at us like that. And God just gave me the strength to just stand there and listen to these people say, we're going to fellowship you for uh, covering up an apostasy and lying. And I just look at them like I look at you now. 
and uh, the other couple and I left. We started getting everything out of the office. First had so many books and the other brother out of the office. It was a Friday afternoon. And we got everything out of there. We got in the car and we went to a restaurant and we celebrated. (laughs) (laughs) At that point, we didn't know the tears we were going to shed. But at that moment, I don't know, we just decided let's go and just we went to Manhattan to a restaurant and we just had a lot of fun that night and then we went home and they only gave us about 12 or 13 hours to put a letter of, uh, what do you call it, resignate, no, appeal, appeal. They usually grant you a week but they wouldn't grant us a week. They just gave us about 12 hours so that night both, both couples were writing up a letter. Chris didn't want to write it and I said, yeah, we better, better do it. But they denied the appeal anyway. The next morning about 11 they came and they deny the appeal and we said, well, what are we going to do? When do we have to leave? And they said, well, you can leave whenever you want. And Chris said, well, when, when are they going to announce our fellowship? And, oh, Monday morning. You know, we have, here we have about a day and a half to leave Bethel, pack our things and leave because Monday morning they're going to announce you're going to be disfell- your disfellowship and you're not going to be around all those Bethelites, you know, walking around the hallways. So we, it was a, it was a terrible ha- day and a half. I mean, we had to get our, our sofa, or whatever we had, our furniture, the little that we had out of there in, in a day and a half, and the Lord really helped us. We had a brother that came and got our things, and and luckily we had Chris' parents here in New York, or else I don't know what we would have done, really, who would have taken us in, because no Jehovah's Witness would take you in after you were disfellowshipped. So we, at least we had his parents and we were able to move into his their apartment which is very small we put our stuff in there and we stay there till we got an apartment of our own so we felt so alone all of a sudden I was walking in a town and I thought the world was empty there was no one I didn't know anyone I went to, to apply for a job and then they asked me for references it's I was stunned. I, I just walked out because I couldn't give any references. I couldn't give the name of anybody. I knew so many thousands of people, and now I didn't know anyone. I couldn't put the name of anyone down for a job reference. And so I, I, I left. I didn't look for a job for about a year. And, um, and I would walk in town and just look at people, and they looked so strange. And apparently they looked happy, though. And I would look at them and smile and... But I was in limbo. We didn't know Christ then. And we, I just walked around like Chris went to work and I would stay home and I was always talking. And I was sleeping and talking to myself all day. Why did they do this to me? I was, I was always talking, always talking, always talking to myself and explaining why, now why did this happen? Now what did we do? And then about six months later, Dwayne called. Thank God. Dwayne called. And we started getting calls, not only from Dwayne, from brothers from Seattle, from Canada, from different places in the United States. And all this literature started coming in. And where is this from? Where did they get our phone number? Where did they get our address? Who are they? You know, all this literature. And then I started reading because for the first time I realized what the organization was. And I found out mostly the information that Dwayne sent. I'm reading all these things about the organization. And I said, oh my God, where have we been? And then Dwayne called, I don't know, your cell phone bill, Mr. Renegal. <laughs> he would spend hours and hours on that phone talking. And uh, finally, when Chris told me about the deal to your price, that I almost died when he told me that. But I said, well, I'll pray about it. I'll, and I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I looked in the Bible, and my mother-in-law and I didn't believe it. So we said, we're going to read, and we're going to prove to Chris that he's wrong. So we would read and read and read, and the more we read, the more, the more we realized, you know, we can't deny it. It's there. And I said, I, I'm not convinced, but it's there. And every time we try to read a scripture, it seems to point to the deity of Christ more than it's been other, anything else. And I still couldn't accept it. So one day we were coming in the car, I don't know, from brother's house, I think, one brother who had been to fellowship. And all of a sudden, we weren't even thinking. It was late at night, and I was in the car, and, and I, all of a sudden, I just said to Chris, I understand it. I got it. And, and Chris says, what? 
I can't understand what being the son of God means. And he says, praise God. Oh, I don't know. I don't remember what he said. I don't think he used that yet. But, <laughs> but I understood it. I, I kind of got it. But then the next day, I kind of, do I really understand it? And then I went for weeks like that. Do I really? When I tried to explain it, then I would get confused. And I said, let, let me leave it that way. Let me leave it that way. And then I, I, Chris would go to work, and I would spend days at home talking. I would be talking to Jehovah. Talk, and then I was confused whether I should use Jesus or Jehovah. And then so I would say, well, Jehovah and Jesus. In my prayers, I would use both names. I, and then, oh, this is so confusing. They have to use both names, Jehovah and Jesus. Yeah. I don't know when I stopped using Jehovah, and then I say Father, and then it comes Jesus. I don't know when that happened, but it happened. I know the confusion went away sometimes. But I would spend days at home just uh, talking to myself when I was cleaning in these conversations with Jehovah and Jesus and, uh, oh, God, but help me. And what am I going to do when I have this confusion? I don't understand this. And then it was so elated, and I didn't have that spirit. And I said, how come I don't have that spirit? There must be something wrong with me. He's born again. How come I don't have that? You know, and one day I felt, I literally felt like, because I always had, like I said before, this feeling that every time he told me something, I would always fight it, and then I would find it out on my own. One day I felt like I was talking like that, sweeping and talking like that to Jehovah, and something seemed to shake me, like it, like it, like it grabbed me by my arms and said, "Stop fighting me." And and that was it. <laughs> I stopped fighting, and then I. I accept Christ that day. And there's no confusion. I love my Lord. Thank you. I must say that the Lord has been very kind to us after that because uh, many things have happened in our lives that have changed. Now we know we have a God that really cares. Now we know that we have so many brothers and sisters around the world. We can walk in any church and feel like we are home you know, with our brothers and sisters. But let me tell you a few things if you, if you can spare the time. Okay? One thing it was this. I, I had, uh, after this happened, uh, Norma had to go to Puerto Rico for a couple of weeks, and I stayed by myself. First night I called her, she said, Chris, there were these two sisters, they were Baptists, and they really helped me. I want to go to a Baptist church. Next night, Dwayne called. I asked Dwayne about the Baptist church. He, he told me a little bit. He gave me a very good suggestion. I said, i got to go and check this. I almost died. I mean, you know what, if you've been a Jehovah Witness, do you have any idea what it is to walk into a church? <laughs> it's like, have you ever seen those mystery movies in, and you've seen the cave that is full of reptiles and, and bats? Well, it's not quite like that, but it's almost like that. And my heart was beating like it was... It was very nice. I really liked it. The two hours went by, I was singing all these songs the first time I had heard them, and I, you know, well, I liked the song very much. I went home that night and I was praying. The pastor had prayed, I remember that, that if anyone had a sickness, if anyone uh, if wanted to be helped, you know, and I wanted to be helped, so I, I raised my hand and all that. But that night I was praying, and let me tell you something, since I was a little boy, as far back as I can remember, I've had a nervous tick. It's a little noise I've made with my teeth and my tongue. And I have never been able to get rid of it. Never. It was uh, something that I just did automatically, to the point that sometimes it hurt. People that were near me would notice it. And some people, like I remember my aunt would tell me when she was near me, she would tell me, she would make me conscious of what I was doing and I would stop. But I would always go back after a little while, you know, when I forgot that she told me. 
And my wife would tell me, and all this, this was something I couldn't get rid It would have been a terrible fight to try to control this thing. I worked with a Jew that is an atheist, and he kept telling me, you're going to have to go to a doctor, you're going to have to do something about this noise you're making. <laughs> well, that night I was praying, but mind you, with my witness trained mind, I would have never, ever asked the Lord to heal me. That was a no-no. Uh, that was a no-no-no, you know. So the Lord had to tell me to ask him, and he did. That night the Lord asked me to ask him to take away my nervous tick. And only because he told me I asked, I, I did, I asked him. And immediately it went off. It was like, it was, now this may, may not seem like a big thing to, to you perhaps, but when you've lived with something for all your life, you know, and in one second of time it's taken away, it's a big thing, it's a very big thing. So I said, did this really happen? Let me go to sleep and I'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> and when I got back home from work, I said, you know, I haven't, I haven't even decided to do it or have done anything and I haven't even think about it. Maybe I should call Norma and tell her. I said, no, no, I better wait one more day. And I did. I waited one more night and sure enough, the following night I called her and when I told her, she said, are you sure? <laughs> well, she could tell you now that she can be absolutely sure because the Lord did. And I, it doesn't make any difference to me what anyone wants to think about it. I know he did it because it happened to me. So let, I praise the Lord for it and I thank him for it. But that's not all. One, one, my, my wife went through a lot of uh, problems with her nerves. She had uh, a lot of pressure. Her family has ostracized her. And... Uh, she, she suffered from fevers. And one day we were in church. It was a resurrection service. It was a beautiful service. It was one of the most beautiful services I've ever seen in my life. And it was so joyful and so marvelous that I had a canker sore in my tongue. And I forgot I had the canker sore and I started to sing and the thing started to bleed. That's as bad as it was. It was horrible the pain I had. But at our regular services in the afternoon, I was going to stay home. I, when I went home, I said, I'm going to have to stay. It, it hurts too much. But then I get out and says, well, it's going to hurt anywhere. So I, I went. And after, after the, the regular service, we went to a little party they were having in the basement. And uh, we were in the kitchen talking to an analysis, and the pastor came by. And he got to talk to us, and somehow Norma told him about her fever. And he says, why don't you let me pray for you? And he did. And he put one hand on her head and one hand on mine. And when he was praying, I felt the Holy Spirit. And I had felt it before. I mean, I remember one time I thought I wasn't touching the ground. And it wasn't, it wasn't a shaky or a spooky experience. It was the greatest experience of love that I've ever felt in my life. And I felt I was being healed, but I didn't, I, I, at that time I couldn't think of my source as of what, what is it that I'm being healed for, I, you know, I don't know. So we went home and that night I went to look for my source. You know, it wasn't there. I said, well, maybe it's on the right side. <laughs> so I looked on the right side. It isn't on the right side. Well, I looked all over the town. And it wasn't there. Brothers, and it was in, in raw flesh, bleeding. And I didn't ask for it. I didn't even think it was happening. The Lord did it. So I praise Him for it. And He has given us the opportunity of talk in two different churches, explaining to the Christians in those churches, uh, how they can help Jehovah's Witnesses. And the one thing that impressed me and made me feel this little 
is the love that these people have for Jehovah's Witnesses. How much they want to help them to come to Christ. And then I could think, well, the way we thought when we were witnesses about these Christians, you know. And uh, here these Christians were willing to take time uh, of uh, an extra meeting. And they stayed there for hours. There was one night in one church where it was 12 o'clock, 12.15. I wanted to go home, but they didn't want to go home. And so we just prayed to the Lord that he keeps using us and that that he enlarges whatever ministry he has in mind for us. May his name be praised. And brothers, we're so glad to be here. And we're glad to have all of you as brothers.